We've talked about how the death of Aurangzeb changed everything for the East India Company in the last video. Let's talk about Aurangzeb a little more. The Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb, unloved by his father Shah Jahan, grew into a bitter and bigoted Islamic Puritan. He was a ruthlessly talented general and a brilliant strategist, but he was as intolerant as anyone could be. His rule became oppressive, harsh and unpopular as he grew older. He broke with the liberals, imposed stricter Sharia laws, and became deeply averse to the Hindu subjects. Wines were banned, Hindu customs adopted by his predecessors were ended, temples were destroyed, and reimposed the jizya tax, the tax imposed on all permanent non-Muslim subjects that had been abolished by his great-grandfather Akbar. Worst of all, he beheaded the ninth of the gurus of the Sikhs, Teg Bahadur. The religious wounds in India Aurangzeb opened in the 17th century were never fully healed to this day. Unable to trust anyone, he marched across the empire, putting down rebellions and severing several alliances that were made over centuries of tolerance. His reckless expansion into the Deccan did most to exhaust the resources of the empire, unleashing formidable enemies like the Marathas under their leader Shivaji into disastrous conflicts. The Marathas sensibly avoided pitch battles with the Mughal armies, but instead opted to ravage the Mughal economy with raids, yielding exorbitant effects that finally brought down the empire. Shivaji's last two raids earned him the status of Lord of Umbrella, Shachapati, and was titled Legitimate Hindu Emperor. It wrecked so much havoc on the Mughal Empire, and on his deathbed, the backbone of the Mughal army was lost to the emperor. It was on March 11th, 1689, the same year the emperor crushed the company. Aurangzeb's armies captured Sambhaji, the eldest son of Shivaji. He was brutally tortured for weeks, his eyes stabbed with nails, tongue cut out, flayed with tiger claws before putting him savagely to death. His body was thrown around and his head was hung on the Delhi gate. In his last years, the winning streak of Aurangzeb began to fail him. He personally marched to take fort after fort, only to see each lost immediately, the moment he turned his back. The Mughal Empire reached its widest extent yet, stretching from Kabul and Afghanistan to peninsular South Indian region. But there were suddenly so many disruptions. There were rebellions, banditry, resistance to taxes. And for the first time then, the Mughal treasury struggled to pay for the administration costs. Aurangzeb died at the age of 88 on 20th of February, 1707. In the years that followed his death, authority of Mughal began to dissolve. Three emperors were murdered. And worst of all, in 1719, four different emperors occupied the infamous peacock throne in rapid succession. The devastating Marathas raids reaped villages to its last grains. Regional Mughal governors behaved as independent rulers and the loyalty to the emperor increasingly affected. One exception to this pattern was Bengal. Mursid Kuli Khan, former Hindu slave converted to Islam and known for his strict tax collecting regime, remained fiercely loyal to the emperor and he continued to send half a million sterling of the revenues every year. By 1720s, Bengal remained as one of the last provinces providing revenues to the Mughal government. As the country became too anarchic, Mursid Khan used the credit networks of a family of Marwawi Aswal Jain financiers to send the tribute to Delhi. The financiers had the title Jagatseths, the bankers of the world, and they controlled the minting, collection, and transfers of revenues of Bengal. The Jagatseths had enormous power, akin to the Rothschilds of the 19th century Europe. The East India Company officials allied with the Jagatseths in this disgusting political scene. East India Company borrowed over 5 million pounds between 1718 and 1730 from the Jagatseths. The absence of the Mughal power emboldened the East India Company officers to enforce its will that would have been impossible a generation earlier. Suppose a Mughal governor was harsh and overtaxing on an East India Company settlement. The East India Company would simply move its operations elsewhere. 
Local weavers and merchants were the losers in this transaction. And in the first case of violence by Englishmen against the ordinary Indians, in 1710, the East India Company rode out of their fortifications and laid waste to 52 villagers and towns, killing innocent villagers and destroying hundreds of acres of fields of paddy. And they were proud of their actions. Murshid Khan wrote to Delhi about the increasingly assertive East India Company officials. But by this time, Delhi was occupied with a much more serious worry. Two million people lived in Delhi in 1737. It was larger than London and Paris combined, and it was still the most prosperous city between Istanbul and Tokyo. As the empire fell into chaos, it hung like a rich, ripe mango, ready to fall in any minute. Ruling this rich and vulnerable empire was the fabulous, effeminate emperor Muhammad Saha, who would spend his afternoon in entertainment in his pleasure dome. By now the Marathas had reached the gates of Delhi in their raids. To save Delhi, the hysterical emperor called for the old general Nizam ul Mulk. But it was not easy even for the seasoned Nizam to bring the Marathas back to their heels. They had grown too powerful. The Nizam, a veteran Mughal general, suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Marathas Baji Rao. This excruciatingly humiliating defeat was nothing to the threat that loomed before them. The notorious Persian invader Nadir Saha had dethroned the Persian crown in a military coup. He had invaded Afghanistan in 1739 and had been looking further towards Delhi for a treasure raid to pluck some golden feathers from the Mughal peacock. On May 21st, 1738, Nadir Saha with a force of 80,000 men crossed into the Mughal Empire, heading for the summer capital of Kabul. This was the first invasion in 200 years in the history of India. It was easy. Less than four months later, about 100 miles north of Delhi, his small army defeated three merged Mughal armies, around a million men. Nadir Shah's job was made increasingly easier by the bitter divisions between Muhammad Shah's two generals, Saharat Khan and Nizam ul -Mul. The Mughal armies were defeated in less than three hours in February 1739. Nadir Shah managed to capture the emperor himself by inviting him to dinner and not allowing him to leave. All the resources of the emperor at the disposal of the Persians, it was written. After Nadir Shah's entry into the Mughal capital, at least 100,000 people were killed. Women were enslaved. The streets were strewn with corpses. The massacre continued until the Nizam went bareheaded and begged Nadir on his knees to spare the people and take revenge on him. He did accept his offer on the condition that the Nizam would give him a hundred crore, 13 billion pounds, a tremendous amount of money before he would agree to leave Delhi. In the days that followed, the Nizam had to loot his own city to cough up and pay the promised indemnity. The accumulated wealth of 350 years changed masters in a moment. The Persians could not believe what they were getting. They had not seen anything like this before. The famed peacock throne worth 260 million pounds was one of the prizes. Embedded on it was both the Kohinoor diamond and the great Timur ruby. Nadir never intended to rule India. And after 57 days, he returned to Persia with treasures the Mughals had amassed over its 200 years of conquest. Nadir Shah took 700 elephants, 4,000 camels, 12,000 horses carrying wagons laden with gold and silver, worth in total an estimated 9 billion pounds. The plunder seized from India was so much, Nadir stopped taxation in Iran for a period of three years following his return. Muhammad Saha remained on the Mughal throne, shrunk and empty. Delhi was suddenly impoverished, sucked off of life. The two greatest governors ceased to send revenues, the days of huge imperial armies had ended forever. But the regional identities and the regional governance had a revival. Bune and Maratha hills entered their golden age. The Rohila Afghans, the Sikhs of Punjab, and the Jats all began to carve independent states. In the west, Jaipur, Jodhpur, and Udaipur reached their age of empowerment. Benares grew. Tanjore in the south would begin to receive patronage. 
Seeing a handful of Persians take Delhi with such ease spurred the Europeans' dream of conquest and empire in India. He had shown the way, and the Europeans were about to become annoyingly persistent. Director General of the French settlement of Pondicherry, Joseph Francois Duplais, realizing relatively lately that the possibilities inherent in trading with India, petitioned the emperor to make him a Nawab, a regional ruler, which was instantly granted. He immediately made plans to increase the French Compagnie des Indes military capabilities. He then moved quickly to get the English to surrender Madras to the French in September 1746. It was in October when the regional Nawab armies tried to block the passage of the French that they realized that nothing in the Mughal armory could match their superior techniques of 17th century European warfare. News came from Europe that the War of the Austrian Succession had ended and Madras would be restored to the East India Company. The English decided that they would not let down its guard ever again. Duplace, however, had been having immense military successes selling weapons and troops elsewhere and the British observed his successes too greedily. The British threw all their military resources into protecting the already profitable trading business. The trade of the Mughal Empire was divided at that time between the French and the English. The Dutch had degenerated, squatting on their heaps of gold and spices. Some successes here and there dazzled the French, and they now boasted foolishly that they by then could take over all the trade of India. They were however inferior to the British in naval power. The company was corrupt, their leaders ignorant, and they campaigned extravagantly. The English, however, were concerned only in developing their trade from the bases in India in all security. The French were doing things ruinously expensively, and everything became impossible to achieve, whereas the British undertook the promise of a great profit of a long run. A party of French Indians led a war party of 240 warriors down Lake Huron into the newly settled farmland of British Ohio. The British were gruesomely massacred, one surviving scalped, the other ceremonially boiled and eaten. The violent raids spread a sense of instability and instilled terror in the hearts of the British traders. On November 1st, the governor of Virginia sent a 21-year-old volunteer north to investigate. His name was George Washington. It was the first act of what the Americans called the French and Indian Wars, also known as the Seven Years' War. It would be fought on multiple continents, from Ohio to Philippines, Cuba to the coast of Nigeria, Quebec to the Gangetic Plains. But the part of the globe it would change most seriously was India. And we will talk about it and how the East India Company started groping its hands upon the opportunity that awaited them in the next video. Hey, before you leave, there's an announcement I'd like to make. Our channel 33 has introduced YouTube channel membership. Yeah, more way to waste money, right? No, your membership will support the channel and its creators greatly. And you'll get access to a lot of member only exclusives like custom wallpapers based on the videos, stickers and gifts out of the many perks. And remember, you'll be supporting the budding channel and its creators most importantly. As always, if you like the video, please hit the like button and consider subscribing and ringing that bell. That way you can get notified when we release a new video. Take care and see you next time.